Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Psych-Synced Psychology. Um, my name is Prescott, and once again, I'm here at Psych-Synced. And today, we're going to continue the Psychology 2E OpenStax textbook with Chapter 6, Learning. So, let's get started. So, what is learning? So, a loggerhead sea turtle hatchlings, or loggerhead sea turtle hatchlings, are born knowing how to find the ocean and how to swim. Unlike the sea turtle, humans must learn how to swim and surf. Um, as humans, we pride ourselves on our ability to learn. So what processes are at work as we come to know what we know? So here you got a little loggerhead sea turtle, kid surfing. So unlearned behaviors are compromised of instincts and reflexes. Now instincts and reflexes are innate behaviors that organisms are born with. They help organisms adapt to their environment. Now reflexes are motor slash neural reactions to a specific stimulus. They are simpler than instincts and involve activity of specific body parts and involve primitive centers of the central nervous system, example, spinal cord and medulla. So, for example, human babies are born with a sucking reflex, where if you, you know, put something at the edge of their mouth, they'll automatically turn towards it to suck on it. That's their reflex. Now, an instinct is a behavior triggered by a broader range of events. So aging, change of seasons. Now, these are more complex and involve movement of the organism as a whole. So sexual activity and migration. That's not just a single body part like reflexes. It's your whole, the whole organism. And they also involve higher brain centers. So it requires a bit more brain power. Now, what is learning? So learning also helps organisms adapt to their environment, but learned behaviors involve change and experience. Now, learning is a relatively permanent change in behavior or knowledge that results from experience. This involves acquiring skills slash knowledge through experience and involves conscious and unconscious processes. Now, associative learning is when an organism makes connections between stimuli or events that occur together in the environment. There are many approaches to learning, and we will look at approaches that are part of behaviorism. So classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and observational learning, which you guys might remember we've touched in previous units. So it'll be a little bit of a refresher, but we'll go a bit more in detail. Now, right here in operant conditioning, if you guys remember, a response is associated with a consequence. This dog has learned that certain behaviors result in receiving a treat. So here you can see the dog pointing because they know they'll get a treat. Now, classical conditioning. Ivan Pavlov's research on the digestive system of dogs unexpectedly led to his disco discovery of the learning process now known as classical conditioning. Now, classical conditioning is a process by which we learn to associate stimuli and, consequently, to anticipate events. So Pavlov noticed that dogs salivated not only at the taste of food, but also at the footsteps of the lattice lab assistant's footsteps. He realized that organisms have two types of responses to its environment unconditioned or unlearned responses, and conditioned or learned responses. In the most famous example, dogs were conditioned to associate the sound of a bell with food. When the dogs heard the bell, they anticipated food and began to salivate. So how does classical conditioning occur? Maybe you guys remember, but if not, we'll go over again. All right, so first off, before conditioning, there's the unconditioned stimulus, or the UCS, which is a stimulus that elicits a reflexive response. So in this circumstance, it'd be the food. And an unconditioned response, which is the UCR, is a natural but unlearned reaction to a stimulus. So salivation response to food. That's the UCR. Now, and, you know, nice little picture here. So food or the UCS leads to the unconditioned response, salivation. Now, during conditioning, there's a neutral stimulus, stimulus, NS, and the stimulus that does not naturally elicit a response. So in Pavlov's case, ringing a bell does not cause salivation by itself prior to conditioning. So the neutral stimulus and unconditioned stimulus are paired repeatedly. So you add the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned to get salivation. Now after conditioning, the conditioned stimulus, CS, is a stimulus that elicits a response after repeatedly being paired with an unconditioned stimulus. And the conditioned response is the behavior caused by the conditioned stimulus. So after conditioning, the bell is the conditioned stimulus, which triggers the conditioned response of salivation, because the dog has associated the ringing of the bell with food. So now it salivates at the ringing of the bell. Going further, or nice little picture, just to break it down easier if you don't want to look at all those words. So the dog salivates on conditioned response in response to food. I'm just going to say UCS and UCR so it doesn't take so long. 
And then, so this is before conditioning, and the dog does not salivate in response to the bell. Now the bell, NS, and food, UCS, are paired during conditioning, and after conditioning, just the sound of the bell alone is enough to cause the dog to salivate. Now, one second, sorry. Now, higher order conditioning. So higher order conditioning is an established condition stimulus is paired with a new neutral stimulus, the second order stimulus, so that eventually the new stimulus also elicits the condition response without the initial condition stimulus being presented. So example, the cat is conditioned to salivate when it hears the electric can opener. The squeaky cabinet door, which is a second order stimulus, is paired with the can opener and the cat salivates when it hears the squeaky cabinet door. So the cat learns to associate the cabinet door with the electric can opener and therefore with food. So originally you have the conditioned stimulus of the can opener with the unconditioned stimulus, the food it elicits the unconditioned response, but there's a second order stimulus, so you know, squeaky cabinet door being open to grab the electric can opener and it causes the conditioned response of salivation. So eventually, the second order stimulus by itself will be enough to make the cat salivate. I don't know if you guys have pets or cats at home, but like not even trying, my cats back home are conditioned to when you go into the room where their food bowls are, they automatically run to their food bowls and like start meowing at you and waiting for you to give them food because they know if you go in there, that means you're getting food. So that would be a second order stimulus the going into the room. So general processes in classical conditioning. So first there's acquisition, which is the initial period of learning when an organism learns to connect a neutral stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus. Usually this requires there to be a very short time interval between the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus for the pairing to be repeated multiple times. Sometimes conditioning can occur when the interval is up to several hours and the pairing occurs only once example taste aversion. Now extinction is a decrease in the condition response when the unconditioned stimulus is no longer presented with the conditioned stimulus. So if food stops being presented with the sound of the bell then eventually the dog will stop responding to the bell. That's extinction. Now spontaneous recovery is the return of a previously extinguished condition response following a rest period. So maybe after a little bit of time the condition response comes back. So here we have the curve of acquisition, extinction, and spontaneous recovery. So the rising curve shows the condition response quickly getting stronger through the repeated pairing of the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. Acquisition right here, CS plus UCS. Then the curve decreases, which shows how the condition response weakens when only the conditioned stimulus is presented, extinction. So conditioned stimulus alone, no longer paired with the unconditioned stimulus. But after a break or pause from conditioning, the condition re response appears, spontaneous recovery. So right here, this is spontaneous recovery of the condition response and extinction when it's alone. So distinguishing between stimuli, organisms need to be able to distinguish between different stimuli in order to respond appropriately. So stimulus discrimination is when an organism learns to respond differently to various stimuli that are similar. So the dog can discriminate between the specific bell sound that signals food and a similar bell sound that does not signal food. Stimulus generalization is when an organism demonstrates the condition response to stimuli that are similar to the conditioned stimulus. So if an individual learns to dislike a specific spider, they will usually then dislike all spiders because they generalize. Oh, you know, for example, you should be scared of black widows. Well, if you teach that to a little kid, maybe they'll interpret that as, oh, I need to be scared of all spiders because they generalize, oh, it has eight legs, small, fangs, eyes, all that stuff. Now, classical conditioning can also lead to habituation. Now, habituation is learning not to respond to a stimulus that is presented repeatedly without change. So as a stimulus is repeated, we learn not to focus our attention on it. So that could be, for example, the whirring of a fan. You know, when you first walk into a room, you might notice the whirring of the fan, it might be like a really loud fan, but over time you habituate to it, you get used to it, and you no longer are aware of that stimulus. It's become background noise. So going on, next we have behaviorism. Again, a little throwback. So John B. Watson used the principles of classical conditioning in the study of human emotion, and he believed that all behavior could be studied as a stimulus response reaction. 
He believed the principles of classical conditioning could be used to condition human emotions, and he conducted a famous study, which I'm sure you guys have at least heard about, called, well, with a little boy called Little Albert. And we will stop the video here for today. We will continue Unit 6 later. Um, again, my name is Prescott. I'm here at Psych Sinks, the Sink Psychology. And I hopefully will see you guys in the next video so we can continue with Chapter 6 of the OpenStax 2E online textbook. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Bye-bye.